I'm Zach Rausch, and this is Heterodox Out Loud. On today's show, we explore how political bias in academia can turn into orthodoxies that undermine truth-seeking and critical inquiry. We cover the pitfalls of political bubbles or silos, the incentives for preserving them, and how increasing diversity is the best solution to this persistent problem. This episode is split into two parts. First, we'll listen to an edited summary of an academic paper which helped lead to the founding of Heterodox Academy. The paper is called Political Diversity Will Improve Social Psychological Science. It was published eight years ago in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. It was written by Jonathan Haidt, Lee Jessam, Jose Duarte, Jarrett Crawford, Phil Tetlock, and Charlotta Stern. This research has been cited in hundreds of academic articles, and influence many scholars across the political spectrum. In part two of this episode, I'll be chatting with social psychologist Lee Jessam, co-author of this research paper. For whatever reason, the skew became more heavily left starting in the 60s and 70s. It is now so left that it has created essentially a mentality of groupthink and conformity, and you are at high risk of denunciation ostracism and even your higher risk of being sanctioned in some way if you don't conform to the prevailing ideology, regardless of how that affects one's science. We'll hear more from Lee in part two. First, an edited summary of the paper. It's narrated by Jonathan Todd Ross. Part one, introduction. In the last few years, social psychology has faced a series of challenges to the validity of its research, including a few high-profile replication failures, a handful of fraud cases, and several articles on questionable research practices and inflated effect sizes. In this article, we suggest that one largely overlooked cause of failure is a lack of political diversity. We review evidence suggesting that political diversity and dissent would improve the reliability and validity of social psychological science. We focus on conservatives as an underrepresented group because the data on the prevalence in psychology of different ideological groups is best for the liberal-conservative contrast and the departure from the proportion of liberals and conservatives in the U.S. population is so dramatic. However, we argue that the field needs more non-liberals, however they self-identify. For example, libertarian, moderate. We must state clearly that the lack of political diversity is not a threat to the validity of specific studies in most areas of research in social psychology. The lack of diversity causes problems for the scientific process primarily in areas related to the political concerns of the left, areas such as race, gender, stereotyping, environmentalism, power, and inequality, as well as in areas where conservatives themselves are studied, such as in moral and political psychology. Part 2. Psychology is less politically diverse than ever. In this section, we reviewed all available information on the political party identification of psychologists, as well as their liberal conservative self-descriptions. Before the 1990s, academic psychology only leaned left. Liberals and Democrats outnumbered conservatives and Republicans by four to one or less. But as the greatest generation retired in the 1990s, and was replaced by baby boomers, the ratio skyrocketed to something more like 12 to 1 in just 20 years. Few psychologists realize just how quickly or completely the field has become a political monoculture. Part 3. Three ways that the lack of diversity undermines social psychology. Might a shared moral historical narrative the liberal-progressive narrative described by sociologist Christian Smith, in a politically homogenous field 
undermine the self-correction processes on which good science depends? We think so. And we present three risk points, three ways in which political homogeneity can threaten the validity of social psychological science, and examples from the extant literature illustrating each point. Risk point number one. Liberal values and assumptions can become embedded into theory and method. The embedding of values occurs when value statements or ideological claims are wrongly treated as objective truth, and observed deviation from that truth is treated as error. For example, in 2007, three psychologists published a paper asserting that individuals with certain right-wing psychological traits were more likely to go along with unethical leaders and decisions than those who had alternative dispositions, yet considered the decisions they defined as unethical, not formally taking a female colleague's side in her sexual harassment complaint against her subordinate, given little information about the case, and a worker placing the well-being of his or her company above unspecified harms to the environment attributed to the company's operations. Liberal values of feminism and environmentalism were embedded directly into the operationalization of ethics, even to the extent that participants were expected to endorse those values in vignettes that lacked the information one would need to make a considered judgment. The appearance of certain words that imply pernicious motives, for instance, deny, legitimize, rationalize, justify, defend, trivialize, may be particularly indicative of research tainted by embedded values. Risk point number two. Researchers may concentrate on topics that validate the liberal progress narrative and avoid topics that contest that narrative. Since the Enlightenment, scientists have thought of themselves as spreading light and pushing back the darkness. The metaphor is apt, but in a political homogeneous field, a larger than optimal number of scientists shine their flashlights on ideologically important regions of the terrain. Doing so leaves many areas unexplored. Even worse, some areas become walled off and inquisitive researchers risk ostracism if they venture in. Example, stereotype accuracy. Since the 1930s, social psychologists have been proclaiming the inaccuracy of social stereotypes, despite lacking evidence of such inaccuracy. Evidence has seemed unnecessary because stereotypes have been, in effect, stereotyped as inherently nasty and inaccurate. Some group stereotypes are indeed hopelessly crude and untestable, but some may rest on valid empiricism and represent subjective estimates of population characteristics. For example, the proportion of people who drop out of high school are victims of crime or endorse policies that support women at work. In this context, it is not surprising that the rigorous empirical study of the accuracy of factual stereotypes was initiated by one of the very few self-avowed conservatives in social psychology, Clark Macaulay. Since then, dozens of studies by independent researchers have yielded evidence that stereotype accuracy, of all sorts of stereotypes, is one of the most robust effects in all of social psychology. Here is a clear example of the value of political diversity. A conservative social psychologist asked a question nobody else thought or dared to ask, and found results that continue to make many social psychologists uncomfortable. Macaulay's willingness to put the assumption of stereotype inaccuracy to an empirical test led to the correction of one of social psychology's most long-standing errors. Risk point number three. Negative attitudes regarding conservatives can produce a psychological science 
that mischaracterizes their traits and attributes. A long-standing view in social political psychology is that the right is more dogmatic and intolerant of ambiguity than the left, a view Philip Tetlock dubbed the rigidity of the right hypothesis. But had social psychologists studied a broad enough range of situations to justify these broad conclusions? Recent evidence suggests not. In 2012, for example, Jared Crawford introduced the ideologically objectionable premise model, which posits that people on the political left and right are equally likely to approach political judgments with their ideological blinders on. That said, they will only do so when the premise of a political judgment is ideologically acceptable. This new model, supported by Crawford's 2012 study comparing divergent left- and right-wing reactions to the acceptability of school prayer, indicates that biases will emerge from both liberals and conservatives depending on the situation. For example, reinterpreting Altemeyer's mandatory school prayer results, Crawford argued that for people low in right-wing authoritarianism, a personality type that describes somebody who is naturally submissive to their authority figures, acts aggressively in the name of said authorities, and is conformist in thought and behavior, who value individual freedom and autonomy. Mandatory school prayer is objectionable. Thus, the very nature of the judgment should shut off any biases in favor of one target over the other. However, for people high in right-wing authoritarianism who value society-wide conformity to traditional morals and values, mandating school prayer is acceptable. This acceptable premise then allows for people high in right-wing authoritarianism to express a bias in favor of Christian over Muslim school prayer. Crawford replaced mandatory prayer with voluntary prayer, which would be acceptable to both people high and low in right-wing authoritarianism. In line with the ideologically objectionable premise model, people high in right-wing authoritarianism were still biased in favor of Christian over Muslim prayer, while people low in right-wing authoritarianism now showed a bias in favor of Muslim over Christian voluntary prayer. Hypocrisy is, therefore, not necessarily a special province of the right. These three risk points illustrate the threats to truth-seeking that emerge when members of a politically homogenous intellectual community are motivated to cast their perceived outgroup, that is, the ones who violate the liberal progressive narrative, in a negative light. If there were more social psychologists who are motivated to question the design and interpretation of studies biased towards liberal values during peer review, or if there were more researchers running their own studies using different methods, social psychologists could be more confident in the validity of their characterizations of conservatives and liberals. Part 4. Why Political Diversity is Likely to Improve Social Psychological Science Diversity can be operationalized in many ways, including demographic diversity, for example, ethnicity, race, and gender, and viewpoint diversity, for example, variation in intellectual viewpoints or professional expertise. Research in organizational psychology suggests that the benefits of viewpoint diversity are more consistent and pronounced than those of demographic diversity and the benefits of viewpoint diversity are most pronounced when organizations are pursuing open-ended exploratory goals like scientific discovery, as opposed to exploitative goals such as applying well-established routines to well-defined problems. Viewpoint diversity may therefore be more valuable than demographic diversity, if social psychology's core goal is to produce broadly valid and generalizable conclusions. Of course, 
demographic diversity can bring viewpoint diversity, but if it is viewpoint diversity that is wanted, then it may be more effective to pursue it directly. It is the lack of political viewpoint diversity that makes social psychology vulnerable to the three risks described in the previous section. Political diversity is likely to have a variety of positive effects by reducing the impact of two familiar mechanisms that we explore shortly, confirmation bias and groupthink. Confirmation bias. People tend to search for evidence that will confirm their existing beliefs while also ignoring or downplaying disconfirming evidence. This confirmation bias is widespread among both laypeople and scientists. Confirmation bias can become even stronger when people confront questions that trigger moral emotions and concerns about group identity. Further, group polarization often exacerbates extremism in echo chambers. Indeed, people are far better at identifying the flaws in other people's evidence gathering than in their own, especially if those other people have dissimilar beliefs. Although such processes may be beneficial for communities whose goal is social cohesion, for example, a religious or activist movement, they can be devastating for scientific communities by leading to widely accepted claims that reflect the scientific community's blind spots more than they reflect justified scientific conclusions. The most obvious cure for this problem is to increase the viewpoint diversity of the field. Nobody has found a way to eradicate confirmation bias in individuals. But we can diversify the field to the point where individual viewpoint biases begin to cancel each other out. Minority Influence Minority influence research has focused on the processes by which minorities influence majority members and thus the group's reasoning. Majorities influence decision-making by producing conformity pressure that creates cohesion and community but they do little to enhance judgmental depth or quality. They also risk creating the type of groupthink that has long been a target of criticism by social psychologists. And there is even evidence that politically diverse teams produce more creative solutions than those that are politically homogeneous. In sum, there are grounds for hypothesizing that increased political diversity would improve the quality of social psychological science because it would increase the degree of scientific dissent, especially on such politicized issues as inequality versus equity, the psychological characteristics of liberals and conservatives, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Social psychologists have shown these effects in many settings— they could take advantage of them within their own ranks. Part 5. Why are there so few non-liberals in social psychology? The evidence does not point to a single answer. To understand why conservatives are so vastly underrepresented in social psychology, we consider five explanations that have frequently been offered to account for a lack of diversity not just in social psychology, but in other contexts as well. For example, the underrepresentation of women and ethnic minorities in STEM fields. Explanation number one. Differences in ability. Are conservatives simply less intelligent than liberals and less able to obtain PhDs and faculty positions? Published studies are mixed. Part of the complexity is that social conservatism correlates with lower cognitive ability test scores, but economic conservatism correlates with higher scores. Libertarians are the political group with the highest IQs, yet they are underrepresented in the social sciences other than economics. Explanation number two. The effects of education on political ideology. Many may view education as enlightening and believe that an enlightened view comports with liberal politics. 
There is little evidence that education causes students to become more liberal. Instead, several longitudinal studies following tens of thousands of college students for many years have concluded that political socialization in college occurs primarily as a function of one's peers, not education per se. Explanation number three, differences in interest. Might liberals simply find a career in social psychology or the academy more broadly more appealing? Yes, for several reasons. The personality trait that correlates most strongly with political liberalism is openness to experience, and people high in that trait are more likely to pursue careers that will let them indulge their curiosity and desire to learn, such as a career in the academy. An academic career requires a Ph.D., and liberals enter and graduate college more interested in pursuing Ph.D.s than do conservatives. Such intrinsic variations in interest may be amplified by a birds-of-a-feather or homophile effect. As a field begins to lean a certain way, the field will likely become increasingly attractive to people suited to that leaning. Over time, the group itself may become characterized by its members. Professors and scientists may come to be seen as liberal, just as nurses are typically thought of as being female. Once that happens, conservatives may disproportionately self-select out of joining the dissimilar group, based on a realistic perception that they do not fit well. Explanation number four. Hostile climate. Might self-selection be amplified by an accurate perception among conservative students that they are not welcome in the social psychology community? Consider the narrative of conservatives that can be formed from some recent conclusions in social psychological research. Compared to liberals, conservatives are less intelligent and less cognitively complex. They are more rigid, dogmatic, and inflexible. Their lower IQ explains their racism and sexism, and their endorsement of inequality explains why they are happier than liberals. As conservative undergraduates encounter the research literature in their social psychology classes, might they recognize cues that the field regards them and their beliefs as defective? And what happens if they do attend graduate school and take part in conferences, classes, and social events in which almost everyone else is liberal? We ourselves have often heard jokes and disparaging comments made by social psychologists about conservatives. Not just in informal settings, but even from the podium at conferences and lectures. The few conservatives who have enrolled in graduate programs hear these comments too. And some of them wrote to hate in the months after his 2011 remarks at the Society for Personality and Social Psychology Convention to describe the hostility and ridicule that forced them to stay in the closet about their political beliefs or to leave the field entirely. Evidence of a hostile climate is not just anecdotal. In 2012, Yol Inbar and Joris Lammers asked social psychology and personality researchers if they perceived a hostile climate towards their political beliefs in their field. Of 17 conservatives, 82% responded yes, with half of those responding very much. In contrast, only 7% of 266 liberals responded yes, with just two of those responding very much. Interestingly, 18 of 25 moderates, or 72%, responded yes, with one responding very much. This surprising result suggests that the hostile climate may adversely affect not only conservatives, but anyone who is not liberal or whose values do not align with the liberal progress narrative. Explanation number five. Discrimination. The literature on political prejudice demonstrates that strongly identified partisans, 
show little compunction about expressing their overt hostility toward the other side. Partisans routinely believe that their hostility towards opposing groups is justified because of the threat posed to their values by dissimilar others. Social psychologists are unlikely to be immune to such psychological processes. Indeed, ample evidence using multiple methods demonstrates that social psychologists do in fact act in discriminatory ways toward non-liberal colleagues and their research. Researchers Inbar and Lammers found that most social psychologists who responded to their survey were willing to explicitly state that they would discriminate against conservatives. Their survey posed the question, if two job candidates with equal qualifications were to apply for an opening in your department, and you knew that one was politically quite conservative, do you think you would be inclined to vote for the more liberal one? Of the 237 liberals, only 18% chose the lowest scale point, not at all. In other words, 82% admitted that they would be at least a little bit prejudiced against a conservative candidate, and 43% chose the midpoint somewhat or above. In contrast, the majority of moderates, 67%, and conservatives, 83%, chose the lowest scale point. Not at all. Conservative graduate students and assistant professors are behaving rationally when they keep their political identities hidden, and when they avoid voicing the dissenting opinions that could be of such great benefit to the field. Moderate and libertarian students may be suffering the same fate. Conclusion Others have sounded this alarm before, particularly Rich Redding in 2001 and Phil Tetlock in 1994. No changes were made in response, but we believe that this time may be different. Social psychologists are in deep and productive discussions about how to address multiple threats to the integrity of their research and publication process. This may be a golden opportunity for the field to take seriously the threats caused by political homogeneity. We have focused on social and personality psychology but the problems we describe occur in other areas of psychology as well as in other social sciences. Fortunately, psychology is uniquely well-prepared to rise to the challenge. The five core values of American Psychological Association include continual pursuit of excellence, knowledge and its application based upon methods of science, outstanding service to its members and to society, social justice, diversity and inclusion, ethical action in all that we do. If discrimination against non-liberals exists at even half the level described in Section 4 of this paper, and if this discrimination damages the quality of some psychological research, then all five core values are being betrayed. Will psychologists tolerate and defend the status quo? Or will psychology make the changes needed to realize its values and improve its science? Social psychology can and should lead the way. Jonathan Todd Ross reading the edited summary of Political Diversity Will Improve Social Psychological Science. If you enjoyed this episode, keep listening. We have an interview coming up in part two with co-author Lee Jussum talking about the blog post you just heard. Thanks to Davies Content for producing this podcast and to Kara Boyer on our communications team. I'm Zach Rausch. Stand by for part two. Hold up. 